Hello, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is a bit about the global view on some of what Helene was just talking about. What does it really take to build global ventures and thinking about the role of innovation hubs in accelerating innovation and entrepreneurship? Can you hear me if I just talk? Is it back again? Okay. What um, I and we at McKinsey have spent quite some time doing recently is thinking about innovation hubs as a time-tested and very successful economic concept where SMEs but also other parts of the ecosystem can really, really thrive. Now, what we, um, a Porter and many others uh, decades ago came up with this kind of concept of the economics of agglomeration. Is it? Is it this? Okay. Um, they came up with the, uh, the concept of the economics of agglomeration, which is basically where you have a cluster of different companies coexisting with government, coexisting with SMEs, coexisting with investors, all in the same geographic proximity. There's many, many popular examples of this. Silicon Valley, Hollywood with the film industry, the California wine cluster, 680 wineries. I'm sure those of us who've been lucky to go there know how, just how close um, all the different vineyards are. And you can go from one to the next to the next. And they actually, they share learnings. They learn from each other in terms of production, in terms of tourism, etc. The leather cluster, there are many all over the world that we've heard about. We've dived a little deeper into why these help ventures. And there are three things that really stand out. The competition between those coexisting in a particular geographic location. So there's competition which helps win and retain customers, helps grow current productivity, but also helps in terms of future productivity, in terms of the pace and direction of innovation. And more often than not, stimulates the formation of new businesses. Often the competition leads to a felt need, and that's, that stimulates more SMEs. Collaboration, obviously, you've got this proximity. And so you've got localization of buyers and sellers. You've got more coordination of trust. And you've got these tight, strong networks that are built up on trust. And people talk all the time and share. And literally, the corridor conversations lead to a lot more collaboration than otherwise. And the localized access. So we have the talent pool. There's a deep supplier base. And you just get more access. Um, the relationships and the community ties mean that you can get to the kind of market, technical, customer information that you really need. And so we see some really concrete outcomes here for entrepreneurs, for the economy, and also for industry. There's a little word missing there. Um, for entrepreneurs, being in this ecosystem means that you can get from knowledge to IP to a business and to that commercialization part even easier and quicker, more efficiently. You also get access to and the adoption, the rapid adoption of cutting edge technologies. And systems in Scotland, for example, and also in the UK, there's a lot of work being done to try and make sure that IP is being adopted as quickly as possible, whether it's in hospitals or whether it's in businesses, just getting it out there, because so often it happens in pockets. For the economy, we see great, um, great benefits in terms of job creation, wage growth, market stimulation. Often governments or mayors um, set these regional targets around innovation. And then you can build up a real ecosystem um, which leads to even more productivity and growth. And industry, we see great in, um, interest from industry and our clients in thinking where to locate in particular geographies, because there they've got this dedicated talent pool. They've got the knowledge sharing that goes on. They've got business development opportunities. So we went and took a look at different hubs around the world and saw that there's fundamental differences in the, in the environment and the infrastructure. Um, and different geographies have really taken care to orient to the needs of entrepreneurs. So I want to do a little world tour. Oh, I'm going to skip over this. I'm going to do a little world tour. So we start in North Carolina. And in North Carolina in the mid-1950s, they were in the midst of a recession. So their average wage was around a third lower than the rest of the US. And they had a brain drain of the most talented to several of the other states. Their economy was at the time dominated by low-wage manufacturing and small-scale agriculture jobs. So what happened? Well, the government and the state's three universities decided to lead an initiative to reverse the economic trends by focusing on what it would really take to build and sustain innovation. And so in about the 1960s, the North Carolina Research Triangle Park was founded as a model for research, innovation, and economic development. And it was between the three universities, as you can see laid out here. 
And they really, what was crucial to the success was this involvement and the, the strong talent pool that was there from the three universities from the beginning. And that led to the park being located equidistant between the three. And, you know, and uh, highways were actually built just to facilitate access and to facilitate this flow of talent between them. And the universities, I mean, this triangle, the Research Triangle Park is strong today. They've just launched, you know, more rounds to, to increase the promise, to increase funding, um, but generates a huge amount of IP and a huge amount of new businesses every single year. And they have lots and lots of different infrastructure and things in place to help support that. But most crucial has been the supply of skilled scientists, engineers and managers from the university and from the local cities. So our next country is um, Finland, because unlike North Carolina, Finland wasn't suffering from a brain drain. But to encourage talent to move in, they needed to make themselves very globally attracted to attractive to business. And they needed to move away from their stereotypical image of a resource-based economy which was dominated by forestry. They only had a small tech uh, cluster, and the uh, education was not at all geared to a knowledge economy. So what happened? Well, there was a very visible government-led drive to leverage the presence of an anchor company. So they had Nokia, um, which at the time was helped seed different tech clusters in Finland, and particularly the Ulu tech cluster, which was one of the first. And there was a lot of other supportive things that went on there. There was the harmonization and liberalization of trade and investment laws, but more than anything, the prioritization of education by the government um, to really complement the new economic needs. And they, they looked at literally where Finland was ranking in terms of schools and university education in science and maths and engineering. And now Finland ranks near the top. But unlike Finland, our next destination has no education or uh, perception problem. In fact, as you can see from this picture, this tech hub saw its origins in the creation of the Cambridge Scientific Instrument Company, which was in 1881 by Horace Darwin, the fifth son of Charles Darwin. We are, of course, talking about Cambridge, uh, the tech cluster in the UK, which really took off in the 60s and 70s with the development of a science park, which had the office and the research space for budding entrepreneurs. And despite having a really central location, Cambridge needed to ensure that everything that was going on there was really linked together, not only with one another, but also with the local business and local investors. And so what they did is they really organised the various communities, linking together the universities, startups, business expertise and financing communities. And here that tight network really led Cambridge to thrive. And there's so many examples, and you've heard of many of them, the Cambridge Network, Springboard, Cambridge Startup Weekend, and this cluster again in, science, in the life sciences and technology continues to thrive. So Cambridge is an excellent example of organic growth, but sometimes you don't have one of the um, oldest and most prestigious universities and the son of Darwin to kickstart your, uh, your uh, hub. So uh, Singapore became an independent country in the 60s and had very low levels of economic prosperity. Um, not many obvious growth drivers and a heterogeneous population, no natural resources. So what happened? Well, the government there really set and actively drove a vision of making Singapore the hub for entrepreneurship and business innovation. And they focused on the strong business environment, prioritising skill development, as we've heard before, focusing on attracting foreign talent to Singapore, opening up the visa systems and positioning Singapore as a destination for R&D research facilities and regional headquarters. They made biomedical science, for example, a policy objective. And they established uh, incubators, um, significant tax deductions, and they reformed uh, clinical trials processes. And there was just a generally a lot of noise around the kind of made in Singapore brand. And so the final destination is another small country. Um, Israel had a rich history. Oh, that's Singapore looking great. Um, it's not Israel. This is Israel. As you can tell by the beautiful uh, sea. Um, had a rich history of innovation and education and didn't really face the same problems as Singapore in terms of creating an innovation hub. But it had another need, which was financing. And before the early 90s, there were absolutely no VC funds in Israel, which resulted in you know, a tough start for any entrepreneur. And so the government set up the first VC fund, the Yosma Fund. And over three years, they established several drop-down funds, each heavily capitalised. And now there's over, um, I think there's about 75 to 100 private VC funds in Israel. I wanted to touch on a couple of examples before finishing of where things haven't worked so well. Um, one example has been in Japan, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, where the initiative um, aimed to create clusters in order to really revitalise the local industry. 
If we think about, and Helene laid out the great framework, which is you know, one, just one way to, to think about what do you actually need in place um, to make some of these hubs thrive, they had a real shortage of human talent to sustain the centre. So there were fewer than 2,000 graduates per year specialising in engineering or science and no plans at, for decreasing strict business regulations or creating incentives to really foster entrepreneurship there. Another example was Malaysia, where um, the... In, in the early 2000s, there was a significant BioValley initiative, um, which cost $160 million US dollars. And the intention was to incorporate three new research institutes on a huge amount of land and launched primarily to decrease Malaysia's re uh, reliance on the electronics industry and the palm oil industry. Again, if we think about the critical factors, um, there was a a huge lack of specialised manpower, and also some, some uh, kind of talent laws that really weren't helping. The Malay's first law that gave priority to Malays when um, public job posts were opened, and a lack of English-speaking capabilities, particularly in the, in the type of talent, and a failure to attract the type of foreign specialised researchers. So I, I think I'm nearly out of time. I want to close by, this is familiar again, um, it's the kind of the standard way of thinking what best practice could look like. But I think that what the Around the World Tour kind of showed to us and what we talk to our clients a lot about is what is it, what's the gap in a particular ecosystem, firstly, and what is it really going to take to close that? There are best practices from systems all over the world that can be drawn on. The second thing is, depending on who we're talking to, if it's an entrepreneur or an investor or academia or the government, everybody has a role, and the most successful hubs have been the ones that really have all the different stakeholders working together and thinking what they can do as, an, as a joined-up, tight network to really make a particular geography the best place for innovation and entrepreneurship. Thank you.